Can you imagine using just one color out of all the watercolors and all the brands you own in one painting? I was curious to see what I might learn after seeing it done with markers because other than the entertainment factor, to be honest, I didn't really see the deeper point of making such a video, but I'm game and I learned a lot of things and I'd like to share all of that with you, so keep watching. I already had my work cut out for me in terms of finding all the red colors I own and making swatches because I made these cool swatch cards a few months ago. I made them so I can move them around so it's super convenient for a project like this one. I think that when you start owning a lot of colors and brands, it's really helpful to do something like that. Although you have to be careful and use your most used watercolor paper for swatching because colors might look slightly different when you use another paper. So I found 15 red colors coming from five different brands. Art Philosophy, Schminky, Sennelier, Winter Newton, and Daniel Smith. They're all pretty good brands and I have a nice quantity of paint there. So what I did was I left out everything that's too orange, pink, or brown, but I ended up with a nice range of bright reds, classic reds, and more deep and dramatic reds. I have way more blues, greens, and yellows in my watercolors than red, and I knew before I started painting that it was going to be a challenging color. I started transferring the pants to an empty metallic set, and the hardest part is actually how messy that can be, especially when paint isn't quite dry in some of the pants. And it's probably my least favorite part of the whole challenge to have to move everything around and think that I have to put it all back into place after that. So I sorted them out from lightest to darkest to make my job easier during the painting. I gotta warn you that I've allowed myself to use paints gray and white watercolor. And actually one thing that I want to point out that I think is going to be one of the takeaways of this video is that in a monochrome painting, you really want to have strong shadows and strong highlights. So I wouldn't see that as cheating, but more as a great asset to your painting. I decided to paint this beautiful bird sitting on a branch but I did it twice. That's where the challenge was difficult because the first attempt was a real piece of work. And I almost thought of not mentioning that, but I think it's important that you see that someone else actually has flaws and also fails once in a while. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. And that was one of them. And I did learn some things that I want to share from it too. A tip for monochrome painting, by the way, is to turn a photo to black and white in your photo editor. It really helps to forget about all the colors in the original photo and really focus on your personal choices. So when I started this, I was imagining something beautiful like this forest I painted a while back, but with red colors and the bird. And it turned out almost dark, like in gothic, scary, weird dark. And what I got reminded of from using 15 reds in a small painting like this with a main subject and a background is that the less colors you use, the better to make your process easier. Seriously, there's nothing more distracting than using too many colors. And I really, really, really suffered there like never before. It was really painful. And that's one of the reasons while you're here, you should use between three to five colors in a painting. It's not just for color harmony, but it's also so you can better focus on the painting itself rather than what color to add where, when. And that's true for colorful and monochrome paintings. And I even think that if I painted this like I would for a normal monochrome painting, I would have chosen a bright red, a darker one, black or gray, and then white watercolor or gouache. And that makes four colors if we count black and white as colors. And I'm sure I would have been better off. It would have turned out much better. Here, I was petrified right from the start by where to add all those reds, if I could even manage. It prevented me from thinking clearly about my normal process. And I ended up with a background that's way too dark and a bird that doesn't even stand out. And what I did was I increased shadows and I added way too many highlights. So that's the point I started feeling a little silly about this video idea. Was I wasting my time and yours with that? Or was it gonna be something more interesting to learn from that? And then I got thinking that in all the marker videos, they usually color, like a coloring. So they actually go on the sections and it's much easier to test colors on the sections than on the whole painting. And that's the approach that I decided to take. After that first attempt, I just moped around for two days, wouldn't look at the failed painting at all, and finally I decided to paint just the bird 
on a bigger scale and go with that section strategy. I rearranged the colors a bit to start fresh because I noticed that one of the colors was more like a pink, so I took that one off. And some others weren't in the right spots, which was even more of a distraction during the first attempt. And right away when I started, I found it so much easier and nicer to test all colors while working on sections of the bird and not worry about the background. It was fun. I didn't feel bothered like the first time. I was able to focus on how light or dark each section was and I picked the brightest of my reds for light tones, followed by the normal reds for mid tones and finally the dark reds for the dark tones. And this time around, I didn't want to make the mistake of adding too much gray too soon and end up with a dark bird, so I kept it for the darkest parts of all, some spots in the fur, feathers, and the eye and beak area. And actually, I didn't use just gray by itself. It was the same in the first painting. I always mixed it to one of my reds to make an even darker version of that red. Having a bright tone alongside more standard or darker ones will really help you in not relying solely on white highlights. And I think it will be a nice touch like my bright reds were here. You can see in this initial layer that they are a lot of paper white highlights, but also a lot of those bright reds that are leaning towards orange a bit, but it adds a nice variety to the piece. I also added water splatters for a nice bloom effect. And that can also be a good thing to do if you plan to leave the experiment at that, like a loose layer, for instance, because it will give you more light in the painting. And these fluffy of feathers look more fluffy with that bloom technique. So even for a bird painting, it's a good technique to use. That first loose layer on that bird also allowed me to use 10 out of my 14 colors really easily. And I wanted to keep going with more depth and a second layer. So I started to repeat and it was easier then to add some of those missing colors with a base to go from. I took advantage of that second layer to refine the strokes and the details. I used mostly the tip of my paintbrush, but I didn't add texture and hair everywhere, just in places because I didn't want to overwork that bird. You can see now clearly how the darkest parts are rare. Just the feathers and beak area pretty much. And when you reach that point of detail, depth and realism, I find it's really nice to add the highlights then. And for that, I actually decided to use a white gel pen, even though I talked about white watercolor at first. And that was very nice for the eye, the beak and some of the fur because it shows better on top of dark areas. And there too, we really want to make sure and keep it light. And you know what, after this, I see myself try this again with blue and I would imagine a large glacier painting with why not a polar bear, that could be cool. Or maybe green with realistic leaves or trees. If that's something you'd like to see, let me know in comments. And for now, I'll send you over to this video next where I share how I'm able to control the amount of overwork better in my art now thanks to a few helpful tips. Thank you for watching and see you next time.